I'm going to make a yukata out of this cotton linen blend fabric. Download the pattern. I've got three and just under three and a half meters of fabric. So a r under just under four yards. There's three meters 40 I've got of this. And the fabric is 136 centimeters or 53 and a half inches wide. So if you've got the pattern, you will see that that's just below fabric A, which is the wider gauge fabric. And this shows you that you don't have to have the exact fabric widths that are in the pattern. You can move a little bit either side of it. And I've talked about that in the pattern. Download the pattern so you know what I'm talking about. Come along and sew with me. I've got three and a half meters. You could have a little less, you could have a little more. And if you have the narrow gauge fabric, you can still sew along. In the pattern, it explains how to cut it, but all the construction is exactly the same because we end up with the same pattern pieces. It's going to be so fun. Have a look at this fabric. It's so beautiful. I'm going to bring it right up close. It's cotton. It's mainly cotton and it's got a linen blend. So there's a little bit of pure linen in there. So it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful weight. Adding linen obviously makes the cloth a bit lighter, but it's still a chunky cloth. So it's got the look of a heavier fabric, but the weight of a lighter one because of that linen component. This is really interesting though. So have a look at this. Is that showing up? Yeah, I think it will if I put it in front of my head. So you can see there, there's a shiny bit over here. Watch this here. See how it shines. That's the linen. So linen is a much longer fiber compared to cotton. And when it's laid flat and treated smoothly, so it's nice and flat, it's quite shiny. It can, it can take on the, the look of, or the luster of a, of a, of a silk, like a tussar silk, you know? So it's a little bit shiny. And then above that, you'll notice there's a, there's a crepe. So the cotton has been twisted twisted up into a crepe so it's twisted so much that it sort of shrinks like this and makes a sort of a crepey texture um, and then there's also a plain weave underneath of cotton as well keeping these crepe fibers together it's absolutely fascinating i don't know where i bought it i can't tell you where you can get it because i bought this at least a decade ago so i but it's going to be so much fun to sew with and it's going to make a beautiful yukata i said before it's three and a half meters it's it's three meters 40 which is fine if you've got the pattern download the pattern the pattern is downloadable it's completely free come along and use it and that way you can you can understand what i'm referencing when i talk about this so the first thing we do obviously we're gonna i've already washed it now i'm going to press it first thing we do before we get to actually cutting the fabric is you cut off the sash with the wider fabric. So the, the top 40 centimeters, I'm going to lop that off the top and that's going to be the sash. So I'm just going to really whip up a sash nice and quickly. You just sew around a rectangle and then pull it through. So simple. Then we get to making the pattern. And to be honest, that's quite simple as well. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go and press this and then we'll talk about cutting. We press the whole thing because you're pressing it again. We're ha you're handling the cloth. This is natural. It's linen and cotton. It's going to crease. So everything gets pressed again. But we're really focusing on this line, on this fold here, and getting that creasing because that's going to separate the fabric right down the center. Just make sure that your selvages are lining up, and that should be the halfway point. There we go. I have three meters of cloth and look at this beautiful crisp line that I've just put down the exact center of it. So you take it like that and you cut down that beautiful center line. Let's split this in half. I now have two strips. Each one is half of the fabric, three meters long. And now what we do is exactly the same thing with each half. So we fold it directly in half, get the selvage lined up with the raw edge, press it like that. And we're pressing it the whole piece of cloth again because you should just continue to keep pressing the cloth to keep it nice 
and iron out all the, the handling creases that, that come with just literally handling the cloth. So I'm going to do this to both of them and then we're going to separate that and we're going to end up with four equal pieces. So three, four quarters of your bolt of cloth. There we go. I have four strips of fabric, all one quarter of the bolt of cloth I started with. They're all the same length and they're all the same width. So I have two that have a selvage on them. These are the outsides. I'm going to just put them to the side just for the minute. You have the two from the inside. These will have a raw edge on either side of them. You see that that has no selvage on either side of the panel. What you do with these, these are your body. So this literally, I'll do it on this side so it doesn't hit that microphone. Is This is this part. And the first thing we need to do is find out where this is. Your shoulder mountain it's called. In Japanese it's called the Katayama. And that literally translates as the shoulder mounted. It's a crease that we put in now and we keep putting in throughout the entire process. You're going to be sick of this term because I'm going to drill it into you the whole time. We find the exact halfway point and we put a big crease right along there so we know exactly where that is. This is such an important part of the pattern because this is where measurements are now taken from. This is how we work out how long you want your row to be when it comes to hemming. If you are shorter than me, then you'll make a deeper hem. If you are taller than me, then you'll make a shorter hem, a narrower hem. And if you're around my height, you make the hem that's in the pattern there. And honestly, that's, that uh, makes a garment that sits just above my feet in the pattern and it will suit a lot of people and you can take off or add a centimeter, half inch, just to adjust it for you. But you don't need to do that much adjusting. This, look, it's an anti-fit garment. It's a, it's a non-fitting garment. When you do wear it, you wrap it around you. By the way, this is my yukata that I've made. You might have seen it on my YouTube. I literally made this one. I tore the fabric up and sewed it. It's on there to see me make it. This is a size UK6 mannequin and it fits her but it also fits me. So I am a rotund Australian. This is a small shop mannequin and it fits both of us. So don't stress about fitting it perfectly to you. This is a garment that fits so many people in one size and you can fit even more by just adjusting it a little bit. Very easy garment to make. So we're talking about the, the katayama, the shoulder mountain. We're pressing that in on both of these pieces that have no selvage. So the inner pieces from your, from your cloth, as I'm putting my wrong sides together, and I'm gonna do a giant steam press onto this and really put it in. And then every time, every time we use this fabric, every time we use these pattern pieces, we pass them and we, we go over them and we're, we're treating their raw edges or sewing something to them. At the end, you press these mountains back in and you do the same with your sleeves. Your sleeves have a soda yama, a sleeve mountain. And the two mountains meet up, they match here to make an alp. So they make a chain of mountains all the way down here. And this is where we get all our measurements and all our precision from. Now you have two pieces left and both of them have the selvage. So these are from the outside of your bolt of cloth. Choose one and fold it exactly in half. Precisely what we just did with the body pieces just now. So I found the exact halfway point of this. So I have two even sleeves and I'm gonna press that in there. So you see I've got a crease now. That's exactly halfway and I'm gonna cut that straight down there so I now have two pieces these are your sleeves and they're going to sit like this do you know why they cut this long it's because it's exactly 
what we have in the fabric. I've taken that edge strip and I've cut it exactly in half and that's how long your sleeves are. That's why they are that long. If there was more fabric, they would be longer. You have your sleeve pieces. We do exactly what we did with the body pieces. You see here, I've got my wrong sides together on both of them. I'm folding them directly in half to find the Sodayama, the sleeve mountain. So this will match up with the Katayama, the shoulder mountain, and it will make for a beautifully balanced and equally sewn kimono. It will be absolutely gorgeous. But we're doing exactly the same thing. And this is the first thing you do once you've cut it. So I've pressed that in. They're all lovely and beautiful. And I've got my body pieces there. That's half the pattern pieces are all done and cut and ready to be sewn. The last thing we do within this last quarter, there are four pattern pieces that we need to extract. So it's very simple. We do the same thing that we did with the other ones and we're just folding it in half and cutting this in half again. That is how simple this is. You're just halving and then halving and then halving. These are the last two strips. From here, we will extract the last four pattern pieces. So I've cut it directly in half. I'm gonna use the edge with the selvage to make the collar. The collar, you need to have a really straight edge as you come where it's joined. And having one that is the selvage, which is the straightest edge that we have around here because we've cut through them, I'm going to keep that side for the collar. I'm going to use the one with the two raw edges as my okumi, so the front opening. Now, this is because I'm going to show you this this um, selvage, which I've left on, you can leave your selvages on, don't worry about that. But if I go to turn this and turn it again, it's actually quite fluffy and it's large and it's gonna take more cloth to get a nice neat edge for the front center front opening. Whereas if this is folded for the collar, we're folding it once and we're sewing it down like that. Now, if I had a gorgeous, nice and simple selvage, in fact, I'll show you one. This is some Thai silk that I have, and it has a really nice and really small and fine selvage. Do you see that? You could turn that back once, and you could sew that down, and that could easily be your center front opening. There wouldn't be a single problem with that. It would look neat as a pin. You could even leave it open. This is, that, that selvage is literally two stitches. There's nothing to it. So it's up to you, and it's up to what you feel about your selvages. Don't ever feel bad about them. They're quite a useful part of a garment. In fact, I've used the selvages on this kimono. I haven't turned this back. I've just sewn it straight down because I like the selvage. It has a little red thread going through it. So it's red, white and blue in the end when you see it. And if you don't like that, if you find that unsightly, then you turn it and you sew it down. It's a very personal thing, but it's up to you. Because we don't have this showing up anywhere else on the garment, I am gonna conceal it. If I wanted to, you could have this as a feature, like a Chanel suit. They often use selvages, well, they often use selvages in the skirt, so they don't remove them, they left them on, and they were part of the skirt front. But also, she would trim the selvages off and then braid them or sew them with other selvages together and different uh, little scraps of cloth and make trim out of them and then and then trim the garment you can do that but it sort of needs to be everywhere or nowhere you do it all or you do nothing at all um, and in this case i'm going to do nothing at all so that means that the piece with two raw edges is going to make up the okumi now the best way to measure the okumi these pieces they are 145 centimeters each they're two inches or five centimeters shorter than from your, on your body piece than halfway of your body piece. So where we put in that katayama, they sit five centimeters shorter than that and they're attached to the front. So, because we know that this is exactly three meters of cloth and I need to take two lots 
of five centimeters off that. I just need to take 10 centimeters off the top of this. And if I take that off, make sure it's 10. Always double check your measurements. Honestly, always double check them. That is one piece of scrap, but that can also be incorporated into the garment. So technically this has no scrap, this garment. Now, I've taken 10 centimeters or two inches off the top of that. All I have to do to find my okumi is fold them directly in half and cut there. It's a really simple method of doing it because you know that you need to subtract something from the top to then have something that's folded directly in half and cut. And then I'll press a crease into it here and cut that open straight across. This is how easy it is to cut this garment. You are literally finding halves and cutting them. There's your two akumi. So you now have six pattern pieces made. The last two are the collars. We have the airy. Airy is Japanese for collars. So you have an airy and you have a tomo airy. Tomo airy is your collar's friend. That's what it translates as. And it sits around the top of the neckline all the way around here. It's the highest use place. So it's the highest wear. You see that it's rubbing against my neck. And it's there because it can be removed and then you take it off and you put it underneath the actual collar to give the garment a second life. So you don't have to lose the garment because the collars become worn or soiled. It's fantastic. It's basically a spare tire, but it's the other way around. The spare tire is on the outside and when it's worn, you put it on the inside. Absolutely fantastic. We cut them. They are a certain length. They are always, unless you're making a tiny garment, they're always 90 centimeters, which is 35 and a half inches. So cut 90 centimeters. And then I use a certain method for cutting this, which just means that you have to measure less. If you don't mind, you can keep, you can make some really precise measurements and that's all well and good for you. But what I do is I cut this. That's exactly 90 centimeters, that piece there. And then, I take the rest of the fabric and I lay the 90 centimeters next to it. So this is the 90 centimeters, the Tomo area, the short collar. And we need to make something that's exactly double this size. So you don't need to measure again. You just need to use the cloth you've already cut. And I bring this up and fold it over until I've got that double. Do you see, I'm going to lift up the camera and so you get the first collar like that. You have the last long piece. I've got it lined up perfectly here at the ends. And then I bring this piece over and make sure that it lines up with this end here. And that is double this piece. So then I cut off the excess, which is down here. like this and there you go that is your two collars so i have two collar pieces i have two front overlaps i have two sleeves and i have two body pieces that is your pattern cut now it's time to do the collar we have the over collar the tomo airy and we have the under collar the airy just the collar we need to make sure you have them in halves. So, like we did with everything else, I'm just gonna fold them directly in half and put a lovely little crease there to know where I am. I'm gonna do the same with the turbo area as well. And I'm doing this so the crease is on the right side. If you think about it, the wrong sides are sandwiched together to get the crease on the right side. And the purpose of this 
is so I can line up my Tomo Airy on top of the Airy. So my over collar onto the under collar and it lines up exactly in the center. So it's gonna sit with both the selvages head facing the same way there. Now, just before I do that, I'm gonna take the over collar and with the wrong side facing towards me, so the right side is now facing down, I'm gonna turn over the edges, I'll pull it up here so you can see, just by half an inch or a centimeter and put a seam allowance in here. And this is so we can easily attach it because it's an interesting way of attaching this to the collar. Just like this. So I've got a seam allowance at each end facing in, so going onto the wrong side of the fabric. Now I'm gonna turn it back over so the right side is facing up. The right side of the under collar is facing up and the right side of the over collar is facing up on top of me. So I've got them sandwiched on top of each other like that, not close together. That's the right side, this is the right side. So they're looking up at me. And what I do now is I line up these two center points so they are in the right place. And then I sort of smooth this out. And I take my chalk and I might put something underneath so I get a nice sharp line. And I'm gonna run the chalk down the side of this part here. Let me pull it back, there you go. Now you can see it a bit better. So you see I've got that seam allowance that I pressed under. The edge of that seam allowance is here and I'm gonna just run the chalk down here. And what this is telling me is where this shall sit once it's sewn to the over collar. And then I'll pull it along. Everything is just staying nice and flat and not moving. And I'm gonna do the same up this end. And that's a guide. And this chalk will fall out of the fabric, obviously. I'm not using something that's gonna stay in the fabric. This will fall out nicely. Basically, this chalk falls out with handling, but a little pat or a nice little wash will wash it out completely. And then it's time to sew this, the over collar to the under collar. And to do so, I'm gonna take you over to the sewing machine and show how we're gonna pin this in place and get this all ready. So you can see, I've got these two folds here, and then just beyond them are the lines that I just made over on the table there, over on the ironing table. By the way, this is that extra piece that I talked about earlier. So this is just a little bit of extra that came off the cloth. Here's the other extra piece, the smaller piece, and I used this bit here to make the coat hook. This is the bit that, this is another bit of scrap. Now, if you want, you can attach this to the underside of the collar here. So I've pressed this directly in half in the same way that I've pressed these directly in half. So I know exactly where the halfway point is and you would, when it comes to it, we would sew it down to here. So I'm just letting you know, we're gonna talk about that in a minute, but right now I'm gonna talk about how we actually attach the over collar to the under collar. So first thing I'm gonna do is pin the center points together. So this is the center. You can see that little mountain there. And I'm just gonna make sure that we know where that is and that that stays in its place. Then I'm gonna come along and do this one first. So there's my line. This little crease here needs to end up there. So what I do is I grab this and bring it back and it shows you how to do this in the in the pattern as well. So this is just like that illustration. And can you see here, I'm gonna fold this back so you can see. What you want is this fabric for a good couple of centimeters to not be twisting at all. 
because you want everything to lay nice and flat. And then see here, I'm lining this crease up with that blue line that I made earlier. If you did this, you might use white chalk or a chalk that's closer as well to your fabric, but I'm doing this so you can see up here, but this chalk will fall out. So don't, don't be anxious about that if you are. And then what I do is I take this seam allowance and I just fold it out like that. And I'm gonna pin, I'm gonna pin down here. I pin across, I'm pinning horizontally because if for some reason I do actually end up stitching over this, I don't get to the pin in time to take it out, which I should, but sometimes I don't. There's less chance of me breaking the needle over the pin that way. Whereas if it was vertically, there's much more chance of me breaking a needle on a pin. So if I pin across, it makes it easier that way. But I should be taking my needles out as I go along. That is best practice and we should all be aiming to do that. So there's that side and I'm gonna sew it straight away. The other side I'll do after this, but I'm gonna get this done because otherwise things start to twist and warp and it gets a bit funny. So, bring my sewing machine down to me. And I've got a nice long stitch, five millimeters, so a quarter of an inch stitch width. You don't need tiny stitches with this. This is securing this in place. The other thing is, I'll get this just to point it out. Can you, where are we looking? Yeah, you can see perfectly. I'm gonna stitch down the center here. You can see there's a fold over here. I'm gonna stitch right down the middle here. And that's so when it's pressed and when it's finished, it's gonna have a little overlap. So the seams meet like this and then they're gonna fold back and rather than being like this and open, they're gonna be turned over like this. In Japanese, this is called kisu, and it's a way of finishing a seam, and it just makes it look as if the garment is floating. It doesn't make the seams look unfinished or unpressed. They're still pressed nice and neat, but instead of you seeing a seam that's sort of pulling itself apart here, you see a lovely little fold. There's about a two millimeter, like a tiny little eighth of an inch little fold there and they look so beautiful it's as if they breathe and then the garment floats if you do it in this way it's called kisu it's one of the most beautiful things about japanese garments and there are a lot of beautiful things about japanese garments so that's saying something right here we go So, let me show you what's happened there. I've sewn it on a nice little stitch down the middle here of the, of the seam allowance. And then when it comes to pressing, this is where the seam is, but it's actually gonna sit there. So you see there's gonna be a little bit of give. And this is gonna be secured down on both sides here. So it's not as if it can just pull like that all the time. It's gonna sit and there'll just be a lip. But do you see that that's, it's like a, it's literally like a little lip that can be sort of opened a bit like that rather than a pulled seam like this. It's a beautiful little detail. It's, it's I really love it. It's one of those things that just makes you fall in love with kimono even more. It really is stunning. So I'm gonna press that down now and then do exactly the same to the other end. Now we're about to sew this and secure the over collar to the under collar. So we've got right sides all facing up and it's sitting on top of it. We're not doing wrong sides together, or right sides together, or any of that, it's all just facing up. But first I am gonna put this little extra piece in. So this is the scrap that we had at the end of cutting, and you can place it exactly like you would the others. This is the center back neck, this area, and a lot of the rest of the collar 
has padding coming in from the other parts of the kimono, from the front extensions and from the actual body piece, they get folded up into here. And you can see that in the pattern. We're gonna come up to that when we attach the collar. There's a lot of lovely, beautiful, or almost origami folding that we use to sort of incorporate this in and make the collar sturdy. If you cut this away, a lot of patterns show you how you cut this away and you sew the collar straight down like you would any collar. You're just adding a band to fabric. When you do that, the collar is only two pieces thick, so it's like this, and it's quite limp. And it's not as beautiful. When you have all this incorporated into it, it gives it padding, gives it strength, and it holds the whole garment onto your body because it's weighted around your neck and hangs down, almost like a necklace. And it holds the kimono on you. Remember, if you have long sleeves, you have a lot of weight pulling the kimono off your shoulders. And this keeps it on. And it just makes it beautiful. It makes the kimono collar stand better. And it just looks more attractive to be honest so remember that we're we're adding more weight to it and that's what we're doing with this as well this is around the set of back neck so there actually isn't much padding going around the set of back neck all the stuff that's being folded in here that all goes away by the time we get back to the neck as you'll see when we attach it so this just adds a little bit more bite if you don't have this do not worry just carry on it's fine the set of back neck so this is already two layers here it's going to be three which means it's six so you're going to be okay but it is a lovely way to use that last bit of fabric if you want to so you see now the collar will be like that it's got some lovely heft to it up here and it will help it make that beautiful curve shape as it goes around the back of your neck and frames the nape of the neck. Now what we do is we secure stitch. So you've still got a giant lovely stitch on there, biggest stitch you possibly can. And you don't have to worry about going back and forth at the top and tail because this is just to secure these in place while we wait for it then to be added to the garment. So that was literally a securing stitch. You do it within the seam allowance, so that's a quarter of an inch because the seam allowance is half an inch. So five millimeters to sew along because the seam allowance is going to be a centimeter. And if it skips or misses some, it doesn't matter. You're basically, what you're doing there is using the stitch as a pin. So all of this stays in place when it comes to moving it about, first of all, in the preparation, but also to actually attaching it to the garment. This now isn't gonna slip out of place. The the kisu are gonna stay where they are and, and the, th the three layers are gonna stay in their right places. But you can see you can miss some here because you're basically pinning it down, but just with a large stitch. Next up, we take the collars. We fold them over like this. So this is the right side facing up at me and I'm gonna put the right sides together like this. Nice and even all the way along. Make sure it's lovely and even. And then I'm gonna sew. the ends shut so before we then press the seam allowances under and this is so we get a nice even seam allowance on either side so i'm going to sew from the corner i'm going to go half an inch or a centimeter in and come down to half an inch or a centimeter square from this corner so there's a centimeter there and a centimeter there half an inch there and half an inch there should be a little square there so then when it comes to folding up the seam allowances we can fold them up in to this part and this will be closed and then this will be bagged out to make a nice sharp point at the end of your collar i come in and i sew one centimeter in to one centimeter down and you'll see what i mean here we're going to this square here So 
So can you see this? That is one centimeter up and one centimeter in from this raw edge and that raw edge, not including that selvage. There we go, I've just turned that out. Do you see that lovely little straight line there? I turned the edges of these, by the way, with the chopstick. So talking about the chopstick again, you can see you can get right up into there and get a really good turn with the edge of the chopstick. And now it's time to fold and prepare the collar. So we get the collar and we fold it in half. And these seams that you've just put in at the tops, they'll help you find that halfway point. And this is important because what we're doing here is prepping our garment construction and the construction of the collar, the, the sewing of the collar to the garment. We're preparing for that right now and making sure that when it comes to it, that goes smoothly. And if you do this well, it will make everything else go a lot easier. If you rush this or you don't pay attention to this, it makes life harder later on. That is just the reality. So I'm going to press and put in the crease, the peak of the collar. And then I'll go through and put in the seam allowance of the collar. And I'm not treading gingerly, but I am just, I am aware of the kisu. So the parts where the over collar meets the under collar. You don't have to be too delicate around them, but you just have to make sure you're aware that they're there and to not sort of crush them or press them back and put an odd little pleat into them. So that's nice. I've found the center of that. What I'm gonna do now is start turning under the seam allowance of the collar by a centimeter, like that. And then once I've done that, I'm gonna bring them back together and turn this to meet that edge. Rather than turning this just to an arbitrary one centimeter, you, you, instead of using that, use the line of the first turn to find the line of the second turn and it will line up. So now we're gonna do some raw edge management. What we do is we turn the raw edges under so they're not seen and we don't have to over. But if you want, you can run this through the serger. You can do an overcasting stitch on your machine. You, what we're doing is just securing the raw edges so they no longer fray and look unsightly. And if you want to overlock them, that's fine. If you want to serge, if you want to overcast stitch on your machine or just do a zigzag stitch down the side, all of that's fine. This is about just getting the raw edges nice. Now, I like to double turn them. It is probably a longer pro, it, well, it is a longer process, I know it is, but it makes it look so beautiful. Let me show you, this is what we make in the pattern, it, and this is what we make in the online course. You can join that, there's a link below. When you download the pattern, you will have received a exclusive discount for the course in which I show you how to make one of these garments and we make this exact garment. It's completely see-through so you can see what we're making and what I'm doing all the time. And these are the scenes that I'm talking about. So you see, it's I think it's the most beautiful way to finish them in this way. Look how lovely they are. Now I could have easily overlocked them, surged them, done an overcast stitch and that would have looked beautiful but there's something about this. What I suggest for this is you grab your biggest pieces first. You can see here, I have the wrong side of the fabric here and I'm turning it so I can see the right side of the fabric on the wrong side. I'm gonna turn it once like this and then I'm gonna turn it again like that and then I'm gonna press this and then I'm going to sew this down and this becomes the seam allowance. This becomes the selvage. So it's time to turn the raw edges. This is about fitting it around your body. If you think of it like this, this panel piece, which is the body, goes up and over on both sides. You have 
a front and a back of the same piece. There's the front and the back. And then there's a second one with a front and a back. Those four pieces surround you. And when the garment is worn, you then have overlaps that sit from the center and out. These are the Akumi or the front extensions. They are made once seemed to be 15 centimeters or six inches wide. You can make them wider if you need to make a larger garment, but that is the size that you make the front extensions to. So it means that the actual fitting of the garment happens with these big body pieces. And we think of these as in quarters because you have the front and the back, and there is two fronts and two backs. So you measure around the widest part of your body, the part that it needs to fit. You then add two inches or five centimeters ease. You divide that by four, and that is how wide your panel piece needs to be once it's been seamed. Now, you can do it like that. You can measure, divide it by four, and make something that fits you in that way. But remember, this garment isn't isn't a fitted garment. This is a garment that sits around you and you wrap it around you. Remember, this garment on the mannequin fits this size six mannequin and it fits me and I'm not a slim person by any means. So you don't need to be too worried about getting the measurements exactly right. Unless you're going to make something that accommodates a larger person, then you need to think about making the garment wider. In that case, we don't turn these edges twice. You can turn them just once and then sew that down because this will be in the seam allowance down here. So you won't actually see this because we're gonna press the seam open. You'll still, it will still be covered, but it can flat, flat back and you can see it. I think the best, for me, I turn it twice just so if it does fold back, you don't see any raw edge, but if you're making this and you're trying to fit it to a larger size, then this is the point where you can really save some inches and make it a little bit bigger. And you can just do uh, an overcast along the side here. So then anything in there is just seam allowance. Or you can um, overlock or surge along the side as well. And so that's just gonna give you more fabric to use to then fit a larger size. I'm going to turn it twice. So a safe bet is you can usually turn the raw edges of this by a quarter of an inch and then half an inch or five millimeters and then a centimeter on either side and then you seam them just within that last turn and it should fit most people. That will make it around a 30 centimeter or a 12 inch panel piece. So that's going to fit 120 centimeters at the widest point. Most of you would have measured and you're probably below that, which means you're gonna have a lovely flowing garment that fits you fine. And if you bought it in a store, that's probably what size it would be. So if you need to make it larger, then we treat the raw edges differently and you can just make them a bit wider. If you wanna make it smaller, you can, you just turn it further and make these seams. You can either seam it so it has wide seams or you can turn it in, in larger folds and then still seam it shortly over here. You're just adjusting the seams to fit the person. That is how you fit this garment. At the end of the day, remember this is not fitted. You're not making a fitted garment. You're making something that sits like this, like I wear it in the Banyan style, or you're making something that wraps around you like this and it overlaps and it doesn't really matter that much. So don't worry too much about this. You're just making sure that the raw edges are nice and neat so when you open it, it looks lovely. My advice is to start with the body pieces, then move to the sleeves, then move to the front overlaps. That way you're getting smaller and smaller each time. So every time you're pressing, you're pressing less fabric. And every time you're sewing, you're sewing less fabric. And it will feel better as you go because things will get really fast and you'll be done with something in a second. When you get to the sleeves, you just want to turn up the ends first and then carry on doing the other sides. Now in the course, in the full online course, 
I actually French seam the sleeves at the at the bottom of the sleeve bag at this part here. So in the course, this part is a French seam rather than open like this. Just to give you another option of how to do it. In the pattern, obviously, we're going to double turn these up. But in the in the course, it says to in the in the course I've given you the I've sort of shown you the way of doing it the other way, which is to French seam it. And to be honest, it it means less work now and more work then. Um, but also, if you have a bulkier fabric, it can be easier to French seam it than to double turn the like this because when you get into this corner down here it can be a bit harder to turn when you've got bulkier fabric it might be with this one as well but i have solutions for that it's just a little bit easier to french seam but it just means that you it also means that there's a little bit more work to do once you get to that part and that's quite close to the end so i like doing it this way because it means there's less work to do as you get to the end of making the yukata but either way is basically the same amount of time um, and doing it this way you're making you know these are high quality finishes for a high quality garment you can just overlock and surge you can even use prinking shears if you just want to have that as the way that you finish your your seam allowances this is definitely a little bit more intense than that but oh it makes them so beautiful it really does it makes something truly wonderful by doing it this way. Now, and because I'm turning this early, see this corner down here? That's the bottom of the sleeve, and this is one of the side seams. I'm just going to pin this so it's turned twice both ways, and I'm going to pin it in place because that is very easily lost. And then you've got a nice neat corner down there. And I'll do the same with all the other corners. So there'll be four pins in these ones. Just a little bit of prep it is. If I was using cotton lawn, I wouldn't have to do any of that. It would just be a, because it, it presses basically with your fingers. So you're just hovering over with the iron just to get them done. But because this is a little bit more of a technical fabric, it's got, it's got a crepe it's got uh, linen running through it it's it's absolutely beautiful but it just means it needs a little bit more work you need to treat it with a little bit more respect and just be spend a little bit more time with it this is the akumi i usually try and make the turns on this just a little bit smaller especially say here i'm using fabric that's a little bit narrower than we we might use in fabric A. So what I'm just doing is you want to make sure it's 15 centimeters once seamed. Obviously it can come in a little bit by that but so it just means that on this one to get it so it's 15 centimeters or six inches across I make the turns, can you see them there? I make them just a little bit smaller so half a centimeter and a half a centimeter instead of half a centimeter and then a whole centimeter and it just gives you a little bit extra leeway when it comes to then putting the garment together if this is a little bit smaller that's okay the whole garment's going to be smaller so it can be a centimeter or so half an inch smaller and of course this is what you do as well with all your seams if you want to make a larger garment you're literally just turning these a little bit less and then maybe doing a smaller seam allowance once it's all done but this is how easy it is to manage the size of the garment and to adjust things to make the garment usable for you when you've got different fabric or you haven't got enough fabric. There's always there's always somewhere that you can take take some centimeters and some inches from to put back into the garment to make it larger. And likewise, if this was too large, you could just turn this with a big turn and then another big turn and you press that so you you can take a lot away from it as well it's a really versatile pattern it really is 
and there's lots that can be done to to get around the things that we need to end up with a beautiful kimono or yukata and that's the end game isn't it we all just want a beautiful garment like that <laughs> and you can do it it's so see it's so easy There we go, that is raw edge management finished. Your garment construction prep is finished and we're now ready to actually construct the garment. So the first thing we're gonna do is get the two body pieces, line them up right sides together. We've done all that raw edge prep now. So when you now do a seam, you sew the seam, you press it open and it's finished. There's no more finishing for the seam. So it might've felt like we were trudging along there, but all of that makes this part so much faster. Once you actually start sewing the seams, you realize just how quickly it's all gonna start whipping up together. I'm gonna sew the center back seam. So from the hem to the neck, sew it together, press it open, lovely. But here I am at center back neck. Here is center back neck. You can see the two Katayama coming in and meeting there beautifully. What we're doing is we're marking the path of the collar on the center back neck. And the reason I'm doing this before we attach the front overlaps, which will attach here along this seam allowance. The reason we do it is because it sits flatter now. Once you have the front overlaps, it will still sit flat, but it's easier to do your marking now than after you've put the front extensions on. So I do that, but we do not cut. So there's lots of, in the pattern you'll see, it will show you how we're gonna make this arc here. And then we cut into it and make slashes so it's easier to then attach the collar. What we're doing now is putting the marks in, then we put the front extensions on, then we come back and cut this ready to put the the collar on and the reason for that is because when you're putting the front extensions on you're going to be pulling and moving this fabric around a lot and when you have slashes in here with no no security at either end it's going to pull the fabric and it can really tear and and fray everything so this is just again about a better workflow it's about making sure that you're doing the right thing at the right time to make things easier for you and the pattern outlines this so just we're marking now, not cutting. So I've just put a little mark in there. That's my center back neck. That's where these two meet and that's where that sewing ends. So that's the very center back neck, which is about to be changed. I use this ruler when I'm doing this. It's got a lovely little square in the middle and it's got all these squares all over it. You don't need to have this, but it makes it, it helps with this process. And if you want, you can take that sheet that's in your pattern and blow it up to the right size. But you don't need a paper pattern to do this. They are such simple, simple measurements that you can just do them with a ruler and a piece of chalk. That's the whole point of this pattern. So I'm gonna get lined up here along these two katayama and I've marked them on the insides as well so I can tell where they are over here and I've got it marked there but I can see this this creased line. I'm not sure if you can see it that well. There you go. You can see it a bit better there. See it running along? And I'm going to go 10 centimeters or four inches either side of the center here. So 10 centimeters, four inches, 10 centimeters. So that's there and that's 25. And then we come down two inches or five centimeters. And this is where I talk about how important these katayama are. That is gonna be your new center back. Your, your collar is gonna pass around here, not here. So when it comes to attaching the shoulders, it's very easy to get make the mistake and think that this is where the shoulders radiate from, but the sleeves will join 
to here, five centimeters or two inches above it. It's very easy to get everything off kilter with that. And when you're putting the side seam together to think that this is the center of the garment when it's actually up here, it's two inches to the north. So I've got a, this is quite dark because I'm showing you on here. Use something lighter or use a light touch when you do this. But what we're doing is we're now creating a box in which to then create the curve. So all we do is come out and do the 10, the four inches or 10 centimeters either side here. And that should be two inches or five centimeters up from those initial marks. So you can see here, I have a box going all the way around. And then this is where I'm going to put the curve in. And that is where your collar is going to travel. Now you don't need a pattern again, find something round, find a glass. This is the top of a paint pot that I have. And that's, you can see, you'll see this throughout the videos. That's where I keep my pins and my chalks <laughs> and then my bobbins. It's a great little set. And there's another, there's another two layers to this and they keep all these things in them. And then when it comes time, they're also fantastic as fabric weights. So it's a great little set. Um, I think I got it on Amazon. So have a look for it. Look up Chinese paint set or Chinese ink set. Um, and you'll find something like this. It's made of porcelain. So it's, it's pottery and it's rather beautiful, isn't it? Look at that. So I use this, but you can use a cup, a mug, something round or use your eye. You can use your eye if you are confident with that. But all I'm doing is you see there's a straight line along here that connects these three dots, straight line along here that connects these three dots, and there's a line along here. I haven't put it in, these are imaginary, and I'll draw them on the screen so you can see what, what I'm doing. And what we're doing is making a curve to come from here around to meet the center back neck. Do you see? like that and I'll take those little dots that I just put in out so that shows you where we're traveling can you see I might bring you down closer there you go it's really faint and you don't need it to be really dark you'll you'll see the color will sort of find its way around this navigate itself around here but this gives you a little guide of where we're cutting into and slashing and I'm just doing it faintly so we know where we're going to be. And now we're going to go and put the front extensions on and then we'll come back and cut into this and make the room for the collar to go around. But just get that, get those measurements in there. That's two inches down, four inches out on either side. And then we just join it up with a little curve. So simple. You remember that my fabric is a little bit narrower than needed. And this is where these small hems, this is where the narrow raw edge management on the front extension really comes into its own. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in and I'm going to have the front extension sit about half an inch or a centimeter below the seam. Do you see that this seam allowance will be uneven on either side? But that's why it's so useful to have this narrow little hem on the front extension. And what I'll do is I'll sew just beyond this line on the, on the front extension. So the front extension isn't going to lose an extra centimeter or a half inch by marrying it up on this side. And then the, it will be a narrow turn that side. And that's what the seam allowance will look like. I've just removed this little piece here and I'll show you why. So I've talked a bit about while we've been doing the raw edge management of the other pieces, how this is boisterous fabric at best. It's actually, even though it's extremely light because it's got that linen content in it, it's quite thick to deal with. So when it came to this little piece in the back, I'm gonna show you what happened and why I'm removing it. And then I'll show you why you would keep it in. So this is why I'm removing it. If you watch this, 
it's too thick and here you see how it's making these points because there's just too much fabric it doesn't need this so I've actually taken it out and I've ripped the seams there just there and I'm about to apply this to the entire garment so I don't need to put that stay stitch in because it's literally about to be sewn back into the garment but while I'm here I'm going to show you when this is useful and when it's useful is when you're dealing with a far thinner material so this is the one that we do in the course you might have seen on my youtube channel there's a full video on how to insert a collar into a garment and this is the garment that i show you it's literally taken from the course and i posted it to youtube i wanted you to see from where to go just how to do it and this is the best way to do it because it's so see-through so can you see here let me see if it shows up on the camera it should there's a line there and a line there I, mean, I can see it I'm not sure if you can I think you can anyway that piece is here so that is there and this is why it's useful on a fabric like this so this is cotton voile and it just gives it a little bit of extra bite this is a part of the collar this is the end of the collar and you can see it's completely see-through so this is just the collar it's this part here the very end of the collar where nothing is actually inside it and you can see it's quite see-through and if I hold it like this you see how how sort of limp it is that's fine down at this part of the collar if you want you can actually line that but you don't have to that's fine down there but this is around the back of the neck and of course if you know anything about your kata and kimono it's that this is quite an important part as far as Japanese aesthetics go this is the most beautiful part as well of the whole ensemble because this is where you bring it down just below the neck you don't wear it up against your neck you wear it below your neck about a fist's width so you hold a fist to the back of your neck and that's where you let the the collar sit that's the nape of the neck and this is just going to give it the ability to curve and really frame the nape of the neck the nape of the neck beautifully as it goes round had i left this in here and it wasn't i'd put it in because i wanted to show you how to put it in so now you know how to how to insert this into that area but i've taken it out because it was too thick and now it's just you can see there's the over there's this is the under collar that's the over collar below that and when it now goes around it's a do you see this it's able to curve it's not doing this there was too much bulk so it's up to you and once you've started making them you'll get used to it if you're starting with cotton cotton lawn and cotton poplin you can put that little bit of extra piece in and it will make a beautiful curve around the back of the neck but if it's too thick you don't have to and you can omit it you can use this in all different ways if you want to you can cut this in half and you can line the very end of the collar if you'd like to add some more heft there you know again you can use this to make a pocket and if you want you can attach a pocket or put a pocket onto a belt which then or a sash which is then worn with the garment but this is just extra fabric now that's just uh leftover so this is by the way the only waste that i have from the from the whole bolt of fabric so that's what i've done there i'm now going to attach the collar i'm going to show you how to do that of course go back to the youtube have a look this is how we attach the collar you see it from the actual online course i've lifted this directly from the online course and put it onto youtube because it's one of my best demonstrations of how to attach the collar to your garment because of the fabric i use this is why i chose this fabric i go on about this all the time but it's so important why i chose this fabric this really thin cotton wire for the online course and you can see there it's because you can see directly through it you can see everything that's going on every shot is a cross section of the garment because of the fabric and that's why i chose it so go and have a look at that or continue and i'm going to do it here as well this is with the linen and cotton so let's carry on and add the collar to the garment you remember before we attached the front extensions so they're now attached you can see them there we put in these little light marks just here 
and I'll put a graphic up so you can see how this lays. This is in your pattern that you've downloaded. This is all there and you can just mark it out, but you don't need to print it out. Just use a ruler, you're marking two inches down and four inches out, and that's how we arrange this. So I'm gonna slash into it up to the four inch mark there, and I'm gonna make little angular slashes here and they're all left out in the pattern now if you're making a traditional japanese kimono or yukata you would never slash into these parts here i've put them there because we're using sewing machines and because we're using different types of fabric so you might be using a polyester or something often a kimono is made of silk and a yukata is made of cotton and if you're making a kimono I'll make this slash here and then i'll explain so you always make this slash this is the center back neck and I'm just snipping in up until the four inch the 10 centimeter mark so if you're making this in a Japanese in the traditional Japanese method you see you've got to get your collar to go around here so if you sewed this just with a sewing machine, you sewed around there, it might be all right depending on your fabric, but usually it will pull and it will have stress marks here and will pull and it will pull into the shoulder and onto the sleeves and it will pull from here down as well if you don't do anything to mitigate this curve because it has to go like this. So you see, we're going to go around. Now, in Japan, what they do, they're using silk and they use... Um, spray water and they use a hot iron and they stretch this they don't just pull they stretch the fabric so like you would in couture if you're putting a dart into a skirt and it's made of wool you would instead of putting a dart in you would use heat and water so heat and moisture to shrink the fabric and create the dart and create the curve it's the same kind of process that they'd use in Japan. So they'd use heat and moisture to then stretch this right up. So you've got a straighter line to go around because the reason they don't slash into here is because in Japan, to clean your garment, to clean your kimono, it gets taken apart and put back in. So they would just quickly hatch this back together and then the whole roll is turned back into the big long tan mono and then it's sent over a set of rollers and steams and it's steamed to be cleaned. You can't throw these into the, into the washing machine, but you can with this. And also it's meant so you can take it apart and put it all back together again for another person, which is why we never subtract from the fabric. Now, it's a bit unorthodox if you're talking in the Japanese ideal to cut into here, but because we're using sewing machines, we're not hand sewing, and because we're making this from all different fabrics, it's the best practice to cut into this. And by cutting in, you've seen in your the, the graphic and you would have seen in the pattern, we just put in a couple of slashes because we're sewing around a curve. So if you're doing this in any other pattern, if you're sewing around a curve and you're trying to get around ease in a pattern, you slash. And do you see now, your collar's gonna go around there and it's got all this space now to follow this line. And it will go off and, and down to the front extensions from here, either way. So that's what we do. And that's what makes it easier. If you don't wanna do that, don't do it. You can also hand sew your collar on if you hand sew it because of the way that you hand sew you're holding it up and it's falling over your hand you can hand sew this on and it doesn't pull as much but we're putting this through a machine so there are different things we have to do because it's machine sewn so that is why we are doing that now I should have done this before I slashed in but actually it helps because it shows me where the line goes Try and do this before then. If not, do it now. It's absolutely fine. It's not in your pattern. It's an optional extra. It's the coat loop. It's so easy to make. So if you do want to do this, it is four inches long. So 10 centimeters. And it's five, it's five centimeters wide. So two inches across. So 
very familiar measurements for us. We went down five centimeters and across 10 centimeters or down two and across four inches. It's the same measurement as that little square there. And I cut this from some of the excess fabric, but you can use any fabric you want to make a coat loop. You could use a contrast, a lovely satin, that would look beautiful, or maybe a velvet, which would feel good against the back of the neck. And all I'm gonna do is place this here and make sure it falls within the seam. So I can see here, because I've slashed in, I've got a point there and a point there. That's the, that's the path of the seam of the collar. So I'm just gonna get it all nice and centered and then how you center it is up to you as well. I'm gonna use the center back seam allowance, which is a good way to center it because on your garment, that's gonna be the visual center rather than maybe the actual center. And I'm just gonna press that on there and pin it into place. So like everything else I've said, with the collar, start on one side and work out, and then start on the other side and work the other way. It's best to work this way down and that way down. If you started down here at the, at the center front opening of the garment and worked all the way up around, then it would be off kilter by the time you get to the other side. This way we keep coming back to the center and we keep centering the garment as we construct it. And now it's just a matter of pinning as much as you can and making sure this is the part that you really have to navigate. What we're trying to do is get around here to get to this point, which is that slash that we made. And then we're home free because then you go straight down to here. But the first part is just navigating this curve and making sure that the collar's going around it without gathering any fabric beneath. And it's just a matter of pinning as much as you can. You can't use too many pins doing this. Don't restrict yourself. Don't tell yourself that you have to use less pins than that. Use as many pins as you need to get this to do the right thing in the right place. No one's judging you on how many pins you're using, don't worry. And do this, do you see that? I'm just checking that under here, that looks like a tuck, but it isn't. It's actually the katayama, so the, the press that we've put in, this is where the sleeve is gonna join from here. And just making sure that this will come around here smoothly and go around without putting a little tuck into the back of the garment, and it won't, so that's good. Now, as you come down the body of the garment, so this is the body, it comes up, that's the back, and then now this is the front going down this way. So it's at a right angle at the moment, and this is the front extension. As you come down here, remember as you cross, well, first things first, be gentle and be, res, remember that you're now on an off grain. You're not on a straight of grain, you're not on a cross grain, and you're not even on the bias because this isn't the natural bias. This is off grain. So we're just not straight and not bias. We're off. Which means that if you do something, do you see that? The fabric is going to stretch if you pull this too hard. So you have to pin this down and you can pull the collar as much as you want. Pull that and, and move that around as much as you want, but be gentle. This stays where it is. And especially when we're sewing, this has to stay the same length. Otherwise it will pull and the, the collar, it's not the worst look to be honest. It looks quite nice because it cowls. So it, the, this will stretch and it will cowl down and give you a curve. That's not what we're after. Even if it looks lovely, it's not what we're after. We're after keeping this nice. So just be gentle with this straight part here when you're pinning and especially when you're sewing. And then the second thing to remember is that we've got a butterflied seam here so that it's been pressed open. So as you pass over here, just be sure that when you pin it down over this seam, that underneath the seam is still pressed open when you do it. Because if you pin it and you pin it like this, then it's going to be open down one end and it's going to be twisting the whole way up the seam. So you just want to make sure that your seams lay flat and that when you pin them, they're laid flat. And then just before you come over them, 
you'll come down from here to here you just make sure that everything's lying flat before you go over it with the sewing machine I always say it takes you as long to put on a collar as it takes to make the entire garment this is the part that takes the time it will take you as long to do this as it does to make everything else so take your time you're not in a rush and this is going to take time don't don't be worried don't don't be anxious if you think oh my goodness this is taking me so long I must be terrible you're not it's just how long it takes it takes a long time to put on the collar because it's a giant collar that goes round a curve and down an off grain straight so it's just it's just a little bit complicated but it's completely navigable and you can do it and once you've done it a few times I let you know it gets much easier it gets so much easier every time you do it you realize wh where you're putting your pins first you'll see that I came down here did a pin then I did that one you learn that as you go along but only you can learn I can write that down in a book to p say put the pins here but then it'll be completely wrong for your fabric or the way that you work so you have to work that bit out yourself but you will and you'll find your own process that works really well and you'll get quite used to putting these on So by the time you've passed that seam, that's the last sort of big chunky bit because you've had the over collar and the under collar plus you've then had the two seams and now it's just the collar and the garment. So it's, it feels quite easy once you get past the seam. I'm going to press the collar now and I mentioned earlier there's an entire video from the online course that I lifted directly from it with the cotton voile yukata that you can see just here behind me I've got that whole video is on YouTube and there's a little link up here for it that shows you from above how we do all this folding so I'm going to talk about how we fold the edges into the collar before we then pass the collar through the machine the second time so have a look at that I'm going to go into depth here as well but just so you know there's an extra resource there and it comes from the online course so you, you can see how we do it in the online course and it's it's just a little bit more detailed there but there, it'll be fine here you can follow along with me in, in this one as well so I've picked the camera up here those of you who are following on with the actual pattern this might look quite familiar to you. So here we have center back coming up to center back neck and we've got a coat loop in there. And here we have the collar. So I'm gonna press this, but then we have these parts and this is the part where we're gonna fold them up. I'll do that again. We're gonna fold them up into the collar and have them meet up with this halfway point where the collar then folds over. And you want them to fit in so we're going to do there's great details and um, diagrams of the folds and they they're quite beautiful folds I, I always think they're like origami so we we're, we're making them beautiful as we do it it doesn't just have to be utilitarian we're not just stuffing it in and we're doing it's a bit like this I'm holding a camera so it's going to be not as neat as I've written in the pattern but I'm showing you the idea of what we're doing do you see that that's now all this fabric 
has been taken in and we do a couple of little folds and then we press that down so then when it comes to do the other side of the collar it will all sit neatly within it and it's completely enclosed so I'm going to do that now and like I said you can see in much more detail on the other video how to do all this stuff but I'm just showing you now what the concept is that's how it started and this is how it shall end that was touch and go I, I honestly think the needle nearly broke but it didn't and as you can see we now have a beautifully attached hefty collar oh and it is it is wonderful it does feel great and now it's time to add the sleeves i like to do my measurements now for the sleeves because they are quick and easy and we wouldn't have lost them with all the fabric handling so we can just put in nice little light marks and they're very simple to do so here I have marked in from the center the from the katayama so have a look at this this is the katayama this is the new center back do you see that there's a two inch difference there and had we not marked this in you might have thought that the sleeve start here which will put everything off by two inches in the rest of the pattern your side seams and everything so i measure from here the katayama not the center back neck and this is where we make our measurements from i said this is where they all come from this is it so i come down 30 centimeters or 12 inches and that's one side of the sleeve and then 10 centimeters this is miyatsu gucci and then from there on carries the side seam so i do exactly the same down the back this is the front that's the back but this is one seam i'm these aren't this isn't two seams but i'm doing two halves of it so there's 30 centimeters that way and there's 30 centimeters that way and 30 centimeters is 12 inches and then 10 centimeters which is four inches And it should look like that and so I take one sleeve and from its Sodeyama so the shoulder mountain the middle of that point I match that up with the Katayama and come down and make sure that I've got 12 inches or 30 centimeters down from there so I'm going to pin these in place and then after I've done this, I'm going to do the other side straight away because we um, sew both these seams at the same point because it just means that there's less throwing around of the garment. I'm going to sew this, then sew the other side and then press them both at once. And it's better that way because you're literally, you're not tossing the garment all around as much. There's less creasing that happens and less pulling. You'll see once you hold this up, that this is a very high stress point down here where the sleeve, where the sleeve seam ends and it's just falling away from the body. So you want as little time spent picking this up and throwing it around while these are getting sewn on. So that's why I do it that way. Now my machine does a great securing stitch at the top and tail of a seam. If yours doesn't, I've written this in the pattern go back and forth at the start. This is one of the highest stress parts of the entire garment, the highest stress. So you want to make sure that it's nice and secure here. This, these sleeves dangle down from here and they have, they meet and then they go apart again. So there's a lot riding on this staying put. So I, if I was using another machine, I'd go back and forth and do five back stitches at each end. This one does a really good couple of forward, couple back. So I don't have to do that anymore. I'm very lucky. If you don't want to do that, you can come up about 10 stitches, then go back 10 stitches and then carry on. Right, all our pattern pieces are now 
part of the garment. It is all together. We're now in a stage, did you notice how quickly the sleeves went on? Once you've done that collar and you've spent your time going around the collar, the collar takes its time and it's a hard thing to do. It's not easy, don't feel bad if you didn't find it easy. Feel fantastic if you did find it easy, so you should. But it's not. But how great does it now feel to whip on the sleeve like that? Two seams and we've done all our finishing already. See all that? Absolutely gorgeous. And now we are pressing and then getting onto the side seams. So it really starts to come together quickly now. But everything is in the garment. You have no other pattern pieces to add now. We're on the home straight. And we press these seams open the same way that we did the seams at the center back and at the front extensions. And you can see once you start pulling this around and moving it on your ironing board, why we did that securing stitch and why we get both the sleeves on at the same time because there is a lot of throwing about and moving things. When you're pressing a seam open, you press it once to secure in the thread, and then you have to press it open from one side and press it open and then press it open from the other side. So you're pressing it a couple of times. You want to get it nice and pressed well, which means that there's a lot of handling going on. Um, and if you're using something, this is very robust fabric as I've found to my own torment throughout the process. But if you're using something quite fragile, I often put a chair at this end or that end, or I bring this over to the, to the sewing table. My table lifts to exactly this height so I can have a really big space to press on. And you just sort of fan everything out and, and have other things holding up. In fact, I've got this sofa just here. That's holding all this out. So have a couch near you or, or find another chair or something or a little stool just to sort of support the garment. There's a lot of weight coming down from the garment now. It's now time to put together the side seams. So line your hems up together and then double check that the Miyatsu Gucci line up. So that second little dot underneath the arm that they line up together as well. The side seams are done. They've been pressed and they're all looking fantastic. So now the whole garment is one thing. It's actually taking the shape. Last thing I need to do is the sleeves and I've already pinned them. I'm gonna bring it over here. I've pinned both of them exactly the same way and I've got it all ready. I've bought the sleeves together using the halfway point at the top and using the bottom to make sure I'm halfway exactly down the sleeve. Now you can mark this with chalk and everything, but to be honest, I do this at the very last point right here because this is where I'm gonna mark in the cuff of the sleeve. Here, I'm just doing it at 20 centimeters, which is eight inches. So down from the very top here, that is the Soda Yama right there, the shoulder mountain. You can see it's inverted. And I found that by just holding this out flat and making sure it was lying flat. I folded this in half and then I pinned it together. And I pinned this part together first, this lower back corner, because I need these to be even. The most important part here is that these two parts, so this is the back of the sleeve and this is gonna be open once we've sewn it all together. And these need to be even so then when we come around and we secure this seam allowance down, it will all lie even when we go around the corner. And I'll show you how to do that later. But first we sew up here and up here. So you can do it in a number of ways. I'd say sew along here first and then I'll show you what to do so we can get a nice crisp corner over here. And then we'll sew up along here to the cuff. And then once we've done all that, we're gonna secure 
this seam allowance back. So we're not sewing this together. This doesn't, this doesn't get closed. This stays open and it means that the whole sleeve moves more graciously. And I've done exactly the same with the other sleeve. So I'm gonna carry through and do it all at once and then press them. Once we've done that, all you've got to do is the hem and you're done. We are so close, so let's get sewing. Now, because this fabric is so, so thick, what I would usually do is you turn up these corners here like this, and you would sew directly from here and do the seam up to the cuff. And that means that when we then turn it, it's gonna be really easy to get a nice fine point. So if you're using a cotton, a lawn, a poplin, um, a voile, anything like that, a satin, a, any silks, you're gonna be fine to do this. This is such bulky fabric. Even though it's so light, it's so dense that I couldn't actually get the machine to go through there. So I have done it straight up to the corner and straight around. And what I'm gonna to have to do is clip, like you would any other corner if you wanna get a nice sharp turn, I'm gonna to have to clip into that because you can see here, there, that bulk comes to, that's a centimetre, so half an inch of bulk that's being created by the turning of all the, all the um, raw edges there. That usually wouldn't happen. So if you're making this in a regular fabric, that's not gonna happen. And there are lots of things that we could have done. You can clip into parts of these to make it better, but what I'm gonna do is just do the thing that you would usually do on a corner and clip in. Oh, my scissors even are struggling to get through that. That is how thick that is. So there you go. Best practice is we don't do that, but you can see that is that is thick there. And I might have to do it at this end as well in order to pass over. Yeah, I'm going to need to when we come when we come past. Oh no, that should that should work. One thing you can do, right? If you have if you have thick fabric, some of you might be using a thicker linen um, and you might be experiencing this as well. If you are, there's always a solution. You're never out of solutions. See here, we've got, it comes out like ram's horns. If you look at it from, well, the direction I am, which hopefully you will be, you will be looking at it this way. It goes up and around that way and up and around that way. They both hook up. And around now what we can do this is what you do if you have bulky seams and you need to turn them for a hem um, when you're making skirts and dresses out of out of wool is you take out the bulk because this is going to be hidden in the seam allowance anyway and I'll show you what it will do because I, I always say don't subtract from the fabric but it, if there's that much fabric, you're going to need to. This is a thick, thick fabric. It's light as a feather, but it is thick as anything, thick as a plank. So I'll do the other side. You see, I literally am just taking out this little bit here. So I've sewn this seam allowance down. It's what's been turned back and what will be turned under. So I'm just gonna take that out as well. And if you ever have a bulky hem and you have your seams running down into the hem, seams run down into a hem, this is a great way. You subtract from what is going to be turned over. And this will be then, if you watch this, this will be opened when it's, when it's finished and turned like that and it's going to sit flat. That's a, it's a couture technique to flatten your hems. It's what you would do if you were making a, um, something in a wool or a thick material in, a, in an old couture house. You would subtract from your, from your seam allowances.
And see, that's not doing anything to the actual structure of the garment either. We're just taking out the bulk. If you're using a, a thinner material, you're not going to have to do this whatsoever. You can just work away as you like. And then, of course, down here, we've got these. Now, this is in the very corner of the garment. So if you want, you can actually whip across here with little stitches to neaten this up. But this is right in the very bottom of the sleeve bag, the furthest point. It's down here. So there's my arm. It's down in this part where you're not really going to see it. But if you want to, you can really neaten that up and just go bit by bit and stitch across here to make that better or get a hand needle and stitch across it as well. But simply because this fabric is so thick, it's been so interesting to work with. It's, it's really fun when you find something new to work with. And you, this is just, it, it blows your mind every time you use it because it's so it's so light, but it's so thick. So it's it's an odd material. It's like the heaviest wool and the lightest silk all matched into one. So it's really, it's really, it's really quite a cool fabric. I'm excited to see how the whole thing turns out. I think it's going to be pretty nice. So there we go. I've gone around there. I'm going to press these and I'm going to press this seam open like that. And the reason I'm going to do that is so this trains back and then we're going to get a cuff out of there. So this is the inside. We're going to sew the cuff down around here and then we're going to do the same kind of process to this. So this will be pressed open. This is the back of the sleeve. We're going to press it open the bottom of the sleeve and then we're going to turn this back and I'm going to tuck them in and we'll go whip around here with the sewing machine as well so then from the outside you don't see any of these big seam allowances and you have to turn this back because you can see here that's the side seam if you don't turn this back this will twist at this point up at the start of a Miyatsu Gucci and then as it meets the side seam and it'll be too big if you press this back to the exact seam allowance we have up on where the sleeve meets the body, then it will sit nice and flush right next to the body. So I'm starting up here. This is the end of the seam with the sleeve and the body meeting. And this is the Miyatsu Gucci coming down over here. And this is the sleeve bag. I'm going to start up about here. You don't have to start right up in here give it some space because we're just holding this back and i'm going to go slowly across here because i feel like i could break a needle this is quite thick so i'm going to scissor me nice and gentle there we go and now i'm going to do the same with the cuff. See there? It's just held just along that edge. And on the outside, oh, look at that. I, I love it. I love a beautiful seam. Do you see that? It's such a lovely space in. That's about a centimeter, half an inch from the edge. That's going to look absolutely gorgeous just hanging over the wrist there. Beautiful. And of course, if you hand stitch that, imagine how beautiful that would look as well. So there's lots of things you can do to really elevate this once you've got the sewing down pat. If you add in hand sewing and hand top stitching, you can really elevate this higher and higher, as high as you want to go. And then you start playing with fabrics. You might have seen on my channel that I use saris and I use all different kinds of fabrics, beautiful. Um, African wax prints, all that kind of stuff. It's going to just make the most beautiful yukatas. So once you know how to do it, then your remit is to go out and make the most beautiful garments you can imagine. The most beautiful thing I do is when I paint silk, and that's my favourite thing to do. And it takes an age to make one, but it makes the most beautiful garments you've ever seen and it's a little hobby that's made me a lot of money so so it's also quite a useful 
little hobby to have that's that's the one that really you can you can make something that's that's a true heirloom for someone that someone wants to treasure and, and have forever we are about to hem you can see here just by the handling I've got quite a few flyaways to deal with so I've got a lovely level hem I'm gonna see how these go I think they should be all right because we're doing a big hem and this is where you use your height measurement to work out just how deep or narrow you make your hem. So I'm making this hem to the pattern. I'm gonna do one centimeter fold and then a three centimeter fold. This is the final press. Now just have a look here. I've actually put a little stitch in here because this was open. And so I could have like, you know, put my finger into the hem. So I've just done a tiny little stitch along the edge to secure that down. You might need to do that as well if you're doing deeper and deeper hems is just to close the actual top of the hem, the, the hem at the center front. Now, you have finished sewing your garment. This is now final press. So I'll press the hem, because I've just finished doing that. And I'll press it from both sides. And then I'm gonna give the whole garment a final press. So there we have it, and here she is. Is that not just the most beautiful linen robe you've ever seen? It is very linen when you look at it. Obviously, it's the linen cotton blend. A fabric, a textile almost <laughs> sent from demons to torture me. But I got through it. And we got through it and made a beautiful garment in the end. It was different to what I'm used to using. I don't know what the fabric is. It's a crepe with a linen bed, but hasn't it made something truly wonderful? So much fun to make, and you can see how much fun it is, and also how much easier it is if you are just using your usual cottons or a nice plain silk satin or something like that. This is a bit more of a technical fabric, a bit thicker of a fabric, so there was a little bit more work in it, but oh, isn't it worth it? So beautiful. Look at that. Beautiful sash hanging down as well. Here, let me show you this. Can I show you? Yeah, you can see the drape when I lift it like that. That shimmer of the linen. That is beautiful, isn't it? Where's the sleeve? And you can see how the sleeve falls and waves like that as well. That is lovely. Yeah, oh, look at that. That is a beautiful garment. I'm so proud. I think it looks absolutely stunning. The lovely collar there with the over collar as well. Really fun. I hope you had your pattern with you and I hope you followed along. I hope you've made something. If you have, please share it with me. You can find my different social medias, but get in touch with me and tell me what you've made. And if you have any questions, ask me questions. I'm here to help. I want you to make things like this. And of course, I've got my online course. So you can come along, watch the process with the cotton value card that we saw all earlier and go through the process at your own pace whenever you want with more detail in the online course. You would have received a discount for it when you downloaded the pattern to make this. So use your discount, come along and make a yukata or a kimono with me. I've had so much fun making this. I hope you enjoyed watching it and I hope you've made something yourself.